Well, thank you very much. You know, I, the, the other uh, introduction that, um, that I'll make is I'm one of two straight white male executive sponsors for diversity and inclusion at Microsoft. So it's a little bit of a joke, but I introduced myself that way because my boss, who's a female, Noelle Walsh, uh, introduced me as the only straight white male executive sponsor for diversity and inclusion in a big partner meeting that we had in, in Seattle. And it took me a little bit, of, you know, uh, took me back. But uh, if somebody wants to know why I, as a straight white male, am a big sponsor of diversity and inclusion in our Q&A, you, uh, you can ask me that question. I want to spend some time this morning talking not about diversity and inclusion, but talking about inclusion. Okay? And I want to talk about uh, inclusion as distinct from diversity and inclusion, just to help us appreciate the fact that those really are two different concepts, uh, both of which are important, but both of which are individually important and not necessarily collectively uh, important. So first, let me ask you, what are your definitions of diversity and inclusion? Yes? Um, diversity and inclusion uh, represents people or practices from different backgrounds, different uh, areas coming together and participating at the same time uh, for any given role. Okay, okay, very good. What else? Yes, sir? Uh, diversity is variety and inclusion is making sure that variety is in your company. Very good, okay. Yes, ma'am? Accepting different perspectives. Okay, good. Providing the same opportunities for all people. Okay, very good, very good. I think that's a, a good enough sample for now. We'll get back to that here in, in just a second. But here would be kind of Webster's definitions of diversity uh, and inclusion. Um, similar to what you guys are saying, is diversity really is this full range of human differences. I think, uh, as I'll talk about here in just a second, I think we tend to focus on gender diversity. We tend to focus maybe a little bit on religious diversity. We might focus a little bit on ethnic diversity. But there's many more dimensions to diversity than just that, as I'll, as I'll show you. Inclusion, as I think a couple of you said, really is about embracing those diverse perspectives and making sure that you're doing the work to modify your culture, reach out to audiences and voices who may not be heard. Those kinds of things is really what inclusion is all about. These are all the dimensions that I think represent diversity. Probably, you could argue there might be more that I'm not even not including. There's a ton of them. I think the important thing about all of that is that this, unfortunately, is the small subset of diverse perspective, diversity that we focus on today. Largely as an industry, academia has a similar focus, uh, society has a similar focus. This is kind of the subset of this that we focus on today. So my next question to you is, what, what do you think is the impact of focusing on this subset as opposed to this set? Is this okay? To start with, okay, then what? So you said to start with, which, which implies that maybe eventually it's not going to be uh, enough. At the point where we think it's not enough, why is it not enough? I feel there's always someone who would feel like they're left out. Some group of people, uh, so it's important to include everyone. Okay. Uh, everybody provides a different perspective and that contributes to the overall growth of whatever we're trying to achieve. Okay, very good. Yeah. Other thoughts, perspectives on that? Yes. I think it's that there's a lot more to a person and only looking at those, it doesn't really represent the person as a whole. And yeah. Yeah, very good. I think one of the implications of, of that comment is that it's not that a person is here or they're here or they're here. These are dimensions. M most of these dimensions, I think, re reflect uh, different characteristics that all of us have. You might be 10 of these things. Um, OK. So I want to talk a little bit now about inclusion, because I want to spend the most of the rest of the talk on, on inclusion. So here's how I think about inclusion, how I would expect uh, or hope that you guys think about exclusion. So this is exclusion. Right? So the idea is there's some 
homogeneous population on the inside and some you know, heterogeneous population on the outside. There may be explicit uh, efforts made to keep the population separate. There may be implicit reasons to keep them separate. But the end result is there's a small group of like-minded or like-backgrounded people and, uh, that are inside the circle and then people that are, are outside are kind of excluded from participating in conversations and, and being part of that group. So this is segregation. So the difference here is that we treat that population that's not on the inside of the circle as kind of a collective group and we kind of separate them uh, and, and treat them as kind of a segregated group, even though that group themselves is heterogeneous. What's an example of that segregation? Either today or 50 years ago or... Is that actual physical? You're talking 50 years ago, so schools, um, movie theaters, all of that based on skin color. Okay, yeah, very good, very good. So that was kind of the civil rights movement in the 1960s that you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Where there are very active, uh, very uh, significant, explicit efforts to keep uh, black populations separate from the white society, especially in the South, but other parts in the US as well. Uh, integration. So this is an attempt to solve the segregation by bringing that group of people that was previously segregated into the inner circle, but still treating them as a separate group. In, in my mind, the difference in perception that these people have here and there is probably not all that significant. And then lastly, this is inclusion. These models make sense? Do you guys appreciate my PowerPoint skills in putting this together? <laughs> I mean, it took me a lot of time to like color these people. And... <laughs> Yeah, okay, so that's kind of my, my, my uh, mental map for, for you to think about, uh, think about in inclusion. <clears throat> Any questions, quibbles, disagreements on that? Yes, ma'am. Do you think integration is good or bad? In, in a sense, it's better than segregation, or is it not? Mm. It's gonna be good and bad? Yeah, so I, I, good from the perspective that these orange people are probably, their heart might start to be in the right place. Uh, and so they're at least open to the conversation about why it may be important to be more inclusive. So I think that part's good. From these people's perspective, it's probably not great, right? Because as I said, I think that the, that perspective probably is very similar to that perspective, the segregation perspective. Yeah. Um, so I think it's both good and bad. It's probably a stepping stone toward inclusion, uh, but it may not be a significant enough step toward inclusion. That all makes sense. Any disagreements with this model? Is anybody not disagreeing just because I'm standing up here and you're sitting up here? <laughs> Feel free to disagree with anything I'm, I'm saying. I would love, love to understand different perspectives and, and make sure we kind of have a shared understanding of, of inclusion. So what's more important in your mind between diversity and inclusion? If we think of those as two distinct concepts, diversity and inclusion, what do you think is the more important of those two? Inclusion, why? Is it just because I'm focusing on inclusion this morning? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you can have diversity without inclusion, and you're gonna make a really horrible workplace for the people, the, the diversity that you do bring into your workplace, whereas if you're more uh, sensitive to having inclusion, then you're gonna make it a very pleasurable and enjoyable work experience for the diversity that you bring to your life. Okay, I'll buy that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Very good. You stole my punchline, uh -oh. right? It, it was kind of a kind of a trick question. Uh, you can't have one. I don't think you can have one without the other. Would anybody disagree with that? You would. Okay, great. I mean, you can have a diverse population. Like in this room, we have a diverse population, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're including all the voices. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I misspoke. You're absolutely right. So. You cannot have inclusion without diversity, but of course you can have 
diversity without inclusion. Yes, ab absolutely. You can have inclusion. I'm sorry, you can have diversity without inclusion, but you can't have inclusion without diversity, is, is essentially what you're saying. Yes. I'll buy that. Yes, I misspoke. You're right. You're right. Other thoughts? See, that disagreement all worked out. We, we're still friends. <laughs> uh, did you have a question come in? Okay, and we're going to talk about outcomes here in, in just a second, so I want to revisit that comment here in, in a couple slides as well, so I think that's great. Other thoughts before we move on? Okay. So this is Sacha's uh, uh, perspective. So you may remember back in, Sandy can help me remember, was it 2016 that Sacha was interviewed at Grace Hopper? And he misspoke a little bit and got himself in trouble. Everybody remember that scenario? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so for those that don't, uh, just real quickly. So Sasha was interviewed at Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper is the world's largest um, conference for female engineers, primarily software engineers in, in the world. Um, it's either in Houston or in Orlando most years. There's also now one in uh, India uh, every year as well. Um, and Sasha was interviewed on stage and I, he was asked the question, about, hey, what, do you, what would you say to uh, a female engineer that feels like she was passed over for promotion or feels like she deserves a promotion? Does everybody remember this scenario? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and his comment was, uh, you should just let, uh, I think it's his, his specific words, where you should just let karma or the system kind of take care of that. Um, which, uh, in retrospect, was a little bit tone deaf uh, uh, from his perspective. And he got beat up in the press about it. And he had only been CEO for a couple years, and so he felt like, ah, oh, my first opportunity to come out and position Microsoft as a strong supporter of diversity and inclusion, he totally blew it on the public stage, is, is how he took it. But he didn't like curl up into a ball, of course. What he did was invest in, sig more significantly, um, in diversity and inclusion at Microsoft. So as a result of that, we have significant training programs. We hold our managers accountable to diversity and inclusion goals as part of their annual commitments. There's a bunch of different investments that came as a result of Sacha coming back and saying, look, I totally screwed up, and I'll bet you you guys would have screwed up too if you had been in my position. So I want to make sure Microsoft as a company doesn't screw up anymore, and we're going to make these investments. So th essentially what Sacha is saying here is, hey, uh, we need to have this diversity and inclusion uh, foundation in the company in order to be successful. This was made about a year after uh, the Grace Hopper event. Do you need, anybody need me to read this quote aloud? You guys read it? Okay, good. That was a joke because I wasn't going to read it. <laughs> um, these are some of the key transformations that we're focusing on at, at Microsoft. So this is kind of today's state or maybe two years ago state and the state that we're aspiring to. And I'm right in front of Sandy kind of on purpose. Um, so the first thing, somebody had mentioned uh, being aware of diversity is probably a good step. I think we're talking about the inclusion slide. Um, being aware, I think, is a great first step. But what we really want is to make sure that we're, we're celebrating diversity and we're accountable for that. Uh, we have great accountability systems, I think, Microsoft. We spend a lot of time talking about the importance of diversity. So we're getting there. We're somewhere on the spectrum of, between awareness and celebrating. Um, the transformation between acknowledging differences uh, and enabling those differences to participate in conversations uh, in the company, whether it's a product design or a business decision. Those conversations, we want to make sure that we're not just saying, hey, there's a different person, but also making sure that different person's perspective is included in the product development or business decision we make. Um, it used to be that diversity was really focused at Microsoft. This was probably six, seven years ago as, hey, we need more female engineers in the company. That was the extent of the conversation that we had about diversity, at least on a daily basis. Um, now we recognize that inclusivity Unless you have inclusivity, the diversity value is not really all that valuable, right? So now we're focusing a lot more on being inclusive um, um, and not just, not just saying, hey, we have more female engineers, but making sure that diverse perspectives are included in those conversations. 
And then lastly, diversity used to be this activity. We, we identify people that go to Grace Hopper. Uh, that was a, a goal that I always had in, in my team. It was an accountability that my boss gave to me. Many managers have that same accountability. And that was the thing that I did for diversity for a number of years, was just say, hey, I'm going to sign up people to go to Grace Hopper. So I had this elaborate system about who's going to get to go, and are they early in career, and are they performing well, and they, would they be a good ambassador for Microsoft? Very sophisticated activity to pick the right people to go to Grace Hopper. Uh, but as you can imagine, that's probably not uh, quite enough. Uh, so we want to move from a uh, manager perspective that diversity is just an activity, you can just check the box and call it done, to really embedded in, uh, in the business and how we run the business. Any of these, all these make sense? Anybody would want to add another one or disagree with what's up here? Yes, sir. What about experiences? Uh, I'm thinking, let's say, for example, let's say, take a PSG venture series that you were here at the bottom and you lived in a suburb area of Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different experience from a child who grows up in the United States and lives in a suburb of Seattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a great video that speaks to that point here in just a second. I just jammed it into the slide deck right as you were talking. Okay, okay. Um, I think it's a great question. So I want to answer that question after I show you this sure. video. Yeah. So why do we care? So why should we care about diversity and inclusion? We spoke about that a little bit, but there's uh, a large number of reasons why businesses should care about diversity and inclusion that I'm sure you've, if you've read Harvard Business Review or had assignments in, in class to talk about diversity and inclusion. You're aware of some of these. So just give me top of mind, what are some of the reasons that businesses should care about diversity and inclusion? Uh, well, businesses are becoming like more expansive and pushing their new countries. So if you're not diverse and inclusive, you'd be losing out on those perspectives. Very good, very good, yeah. Innovation and competition. Very good. Yeah. Different people have different experiences, so they can, uh, by bringing diverse people, you bring in different experiences which can help in any kind of uh, uh, unknown scenario in a project. Yeah, so I, similar to that point, I think the, the thing that I would say is that for complex problems that we have in Microsoft, oftentimes it's the different perspectives that make sure that the result is as good a quality as we want it to be. If it was just me and three other of my straight white male friends getting together who all have similar experiences and trying to make an optimal business decision, the decision usually is not as robust as you coming to me and saying, hey, that seems crazy. What if we thought about it this way, right? At a minimum, I would want to make sure that my idea is pressure tested against those diverse perspectives. Um, at, uh, and, and the ideal scenario would be I changed my mind because I hadn't considered uh, some perspectives that I actively tried to include in the conversation. PR. PR, tell me more about that. I mean, <clears throat> there's also a monetary gain or loss because diversity has become a very main thing, almost buzz for lawsuits. I mean, corporate, some companies have lost their business because they weren't COVID competent. Yeah. So all, even though I, it should be because for innovation and all that, just being, being diverse in the region, definitely there's a monetary value, lawsuits. Yeah, very, very good. So uh, any more, I think that diversity uh, and inclusion is such a core expectation that at least we in the US have about corporate America, that the best you could do is not get some PR written about you because of some diversity or inclusion person. If you do, generally it's a bad thing, right? Rarely do companies today say, hey, I made a fantastic improvement in my representation numbers year over year, and I'm here to celebrate it, because they're still so awful that it's nothing yet to brag about. Um, on the other hand, if we screw up, or as is in the press with, with some other uh, companies in the software industry, uh, that you know, for whatever ra reason, wage suppression for certain audiences um, uh, is an issue in the company, whether it's implicit or explicit, uh, those tend to be negative PR issues. So I'm not aware it, recently where the software industry has been able to celebrate their success and generate PR because of that, but uh, many cases where they're getting negative PR because of that. Any other questions, comments on this? Yes. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so here's just three that I want to talk about. The first is, this is 
uh, one of the reasons why I started to get involved and interested in diversity and inclusion is because what was happening for me is I was really struggling to find software engineers. Uh, because software engineering is such a male dominated industry, or at least it was, because the number of software job positions that I had open was large and growing, very difficult for me to find enough software engineers in order to fill those positions. It's equally true, not equally true, it's almost true from a business perspective as well, that uh, some of our business majors, our, M our MBAs at Microsoft, typically uh, male as well, partly because the culture was fairly male dominated, um, but partly a reflection of the cohort that graduated from business schools tended to be male dominated as well. We struggled to find business folks to come and work in our company. And so just from a tactical workforce availability perspective, making sure that we're tapping into different audiences um, helps us secure the workforce that we need in order to run our business. Right? So it's not very altruistic, but just as a practical matter, unless we're looking for every opportunity we can to recruit into the company uh, from different audiences, we're not going to fulfill our, our uh, workforce availability requirements. Thoughts about that? No? Okay. It's not the most altruistic reason, I get it, uh, but from a business perspective, it's very important. This is what a couple of you are saying, is that typically over time, diverse teams tend to be more innovative. In the short term, you know, as you go through the storming, norming, forming, performing model, a lot of agitation, at least early on, as you figure out how to work together when you're coming from different perspectives about the same problem which is why the growth curve is a little bit slow. But over time, those teams that do figure out how to bring in and value diverse perspectives tend to have a higher rate of innovation. You guys have probably seen this article before. No? Go look for it. Um, there's a, a nice 10-page white paper that McKinsey wrote. HBR has done a number of takes on that as well. Uh, but based on all the all the research that's out there and based on evidence inside Microsoft, this is one of the biggest reasons that we care about uh, diversity and inclusion. And then somebody else mentioned this, is we want to build products that are a reflection of the customers that buy our products. And to the extent that we have straight white males in the Pacific Northwest building products for people that live in different countries, South America or Africa or Asia, uh, they tend, those products tend not to be as easily adopted as if we're bringing diverse, um, uh, including diverse perspectives in that decision making process about what the product design should be and who that target audience is and who the, uh, what the relevant scenarios are that we should be building toward. Okay, those are my top three. You might have your own top three. What did I miss? Everybody just happy with these three? Okay, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call it even, and now show that video that I had uh, rumored to include in this deck. Is that too loud or loud enough? Good. Your job is to tell me why I included this video in this diversity and inclusion. Uh, my life started in a dangerous slum outside of Rio de Janeiro. Growing up there was really difficult. Even now it's painful for me to think about it. Six of us lived in a tiny shack the neighborhood was dirty, smelly, trash and rats were everywhere. Everything gets limited in the slums. Your education, your work, your sense of possibility. I started dealing when I was 14. It landed me to the juvenile detention twice. Prison is where Wanderson found hope. He took a technology course offered through Microsoft partner Center for Digital Inclusion, or CDI. CDI mission is transforming lives through technology, inspiring people to change themselves and to change the world. I took CDI's class. I saw the possibilities technology offered. You need to be convinced you have opportunities, even when reality keeps saying that you don't. That's the key. 
just being able to complete that Microsoft CDI course and to show my family what I did, that was magical. It motivated me to learn more. Walters left prison seven years ago. He now works for CDI, teaching and inspiring others who come from similar situations. One that so knows how to teach so you learn. His course changed my life, my whole family's life for the better. I see one thing Walters was scared me. I think about living in the slum, I'm going to cry. It's difficult. We had a hard time finding anything to eat there. Now we've moved. We have a computer and internet connection, thanks to God. Wanderson's class inspired me to go to college and to study communications and technology. It's gratifying to know that in seven years, more than 5,000 people have taken my courses. When I see my students grow, it motivates me to do more and more. I get a glint in my eye because this is what I love to do and I'm always looking for ways to bring new knowledge to my courses. I believe strongly that we can transform a slum, a neighborhood, a city, and even the world. For you guys who work in Microsoft, I would like to share with you how amazing is this work to use technology to empower people to transform the life of people. Eu sou uma how the support Microsoft provides give us a second chance so please work with determination, with fire in your eyes, knowing the work you are doing is important and it's saving lives. Okay, so why, why did I include that uh, video, do you think? Yes, sir. I think it boils down to opportunities and not everyone starts at the same level or uh, they don't have a same starting point. Very good, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, good point, okay. You said from you from an unconventional background um, as well and empowered them to take a project and run for it, uh, run with it so they were able to build upon what Microsoft already started. Yeah, very good. Now this, let me just clarify one thing. So my, Microsoft is a partner with this uh, group called CDI. Uh, we're a funding partner, technology partner with this, with this group. The heroes in the story are not Microsoft. So uh, I didn't show this because I think Microsoft does a fantastic job of supporting this organization. Uh, the hero in the story is that guy whose name is Wanderson, right? That guy that in prison. So uh, it really, uh, I just want to make sure it wasn't a Microsoft promotional video that I'm showing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think Yeah, 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 very good, very good. Other thoughts about that? Yeah, and I'm sorry for the music. The mu music is kind of evocative and a little emotional and, and whatever, but the, the storyline there, I think, is it's, in, in my mind, it's an example of the extent to which we as a society need to think about inclusion. In some cases, there will be heroic efforts required to include populations into the 21st century economy. Right, and that's what he was, he was focused on. It's relatively easier, of course, when we have diverse perspectives in this room to make sure all voices are being heard. You know, we all have to be aware that different perspectives are being represented and value them and, and encourage them and so forth. That's you know, hard, but it's not that hard. Right? So if we think about inclusion, I think the work that we have to do as a society spans the gamut from you know, how do we make sure people in this classroom feel valued all the way to how, how do we make sure that we're breaking down digital barriers to make sure in, uh, uh, significant populations get an opportunity to participate in the economy. Uh, I forgot who asked that question and I teed up the video. Oh, there we go. Did that answer the question? Okay, or, or close enough? Okay. Now, uh, this is a little bit of an exercise uh, that I want you guys to get together with maybe your, your partner on. So start thinking about who your buddy's gonna be because, oops, did I go the wrong way? No. I wanted to remind you of this. Everybody have this in mind? Okay, because 
I want you to think about uh, these 10 inclusive behaviors. And I'll walk through them really quick. So the first one is including, uh, start examining your own as assumptions. Uh, if somebody's coming to you with a different perspective, challenge yourself a little bit about why you have your perspective, uh, the assumptions that led up to your perspective. Uh, make a habit of asking questions. If you find yourself always talking, the corollary to that is that you're rarely listening. Uh, and so can you challenge yourself to maybe ask more questions than you make statements? Uh, making sure all voices are being heard. So I try to, I don't do a fantastic job, but I try to scan the room and make sure that people that are making eye contact or raising their hands or those kinds of things, they have an opportunity to contribute in the conversation. For people that are not raising their hands, you know, at least in team meetings, I won't do it to you guys, but at least in team meetings, how do we draw those people out and make sure that the, the insights that they have are represented in the conversation in spite of them uh, being maybe a little introverted or quiet or shy about their perspectives. Um, the, the next one is, we, I think we all have a habit of taking maybe the first three or four words that somebody starts speaking and assume that we know what they're gonna say after that. Right, who's, who, who's done that? Okay. This one is really, how do you make sure that you listen to that person until they feel like they've been heard? How do, you, how do you do that? The next one is um, don't let disagreements fester. Somebody uh, in the back disagreed with my, uh, my statement before, and bravely challenged me on that. That was fantastic. That's a great example of, hey, let's not let that. Uh, I would hate for you to go out into, you're going to the Phoenix this morning? No? no. Some of you guys are going to Phoenix. Um, you can ride with them to Phoenix. I think there's a bus probably. <laughs> But I would hate for you to go into spring break thinking, gosh, I disagreed with that guy, what that guy Mike said. So uh, look for opportunities to resolve disagreements and don't let them, uh, you'll, you'll thank yourselves for it, I guarantee it. If you're reacting strongly to somebody, why is that? Is that you or is it them? Ourselves. Huh? 99% of the time it's you, it's not them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's never me, it's always you. But, yeah. um, do you do enough to seek input from diverse perspectives? Do you go out and mine those diverse perspectives even though they're not coming to you with their thoughts, even though they not, may not be in the same classroom or the same meeting room as you're in? Uh, taking action to resolve stressful situations. Um, I try to do that a little bit with humor. And so even in tense meetings, I, I try to you know, light, lighten the mood a little bit, maybe to a fault. Uh, Adonis is on my team. He can tell you whether that's to a fault or not. Uh, but making sure that the conversation doesn't get increasingly stressful and anxious, I think having that behavior and culture in the team is going to encourage those that might be shy or, or more introverted or whatever to bring their perspectives forward. If you do that, have this tense atmosphere, it tends to suppress a, a ton of voices that are in the room. Uh, understanding each other's uh, contribution. It may not be easy on the onset if somebody tells you something that doesn't fit your worldview to value that, right? Uh, but challenge yourself to try to understand, hey, given that my worldview and yours is different, how can we complement each other's worldview and, and extend uh, and enhance my own? And lastly, be brave, right? All this stuff is going to take work. You have to step outside your comfort zone in many of these cases. Um, but just be brave and practice, practice, practice. In our team, we have, uh, we pick one of these a month. And somebody on the team volunteers to write a blog about it. <coughs> Uh, talk about it at a, we have a, um, a brown bag meeting every Thursday where we share different things around the team. Um, uh, they can choose to activate this inclusive behavior any way they want, but we pick one of these a month on a rotating basis. And so we just remind ourselves as a team uh, which of these things we should be focused on. Now your exercise. Uh, did you guys already pick up a group? Do you have a buddy that you're going to work with on this? Okay. Pick one, of, pick one of these things, these scenarios on the board. Introvert, extrovert, remote participants, or age. Those are our kind of classical uh, inclusion uh, challenges. And tell me which of these inclusive behaviors you would bring in on that scenario. I want you to pick at least three of these behaviors that you think can help solve, air quotes around the word solve, the scenario that you picked. OK? That makes sense? Pick at least three. Can't be just one. You can't just say be brave and call it a day. Okay. 
So first question I have, and then we'll get into what you guys came up with for your scenario. So who thinks there's a right answer that I'm looking for here? OK, there's no right answer, uh, I, don't, I don't think. Um, who picked age? You guys did. What did you come up with? So we came up with five. OK. Ensure all voices are heard um, so that she feels like she's contributing and uh, examine your assumptions. So it may just be her and how she views the millennials and not necessarily how the situation actually is. Um, if you have a strong reaction, ask yourself why. Listen carefully until they feel understood. So that includes her group as well. So they need to make sure that she feels comfortable speaking and having her voice heard. And then our fifth one was make a habit of asking questions so that opens people up and allows her the opportunity to contribute. OK, very good. Um, uh, the first one, tell me the first behavior again. So what would you do? How, tell me a practical uh, example of what you would do to make sure that uh, in your scenario, is it a he or she? I think it's she. She, OK. How she would how you'd make sure she, her voice was being heard? So I think a big part of that would make a habit of asking questions. So OK. If you're mm -hmm. asking even leading questions, it allows the opportunity for her voice to be heard. OK, very good, very good. Yeah, love that. Any thoughts? Anybody think that their answer was totally wrong? No? OK, so just an applause for them being brave going first. Who picked remote uh, remote workers? I forgot how we worded it, but remote employees or who picked the remote participants one? Anybody? You guys did? What did you guys come up with? Um, well, I can do it yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So we um, we did include and seek input, um, especially because sometimes, especially with the like one of those monitors in the table, you don't really, or the phone call, not a Zoom call, you don't really remember that they're there. And so just kind of like keeping that reminder to include them and like see their input, especially if they're being quiet. And then, um, oh, ensure all voices are heard, kind of tag team with that, as well as make a habit of asking questions, which all goes along with that, asking questions, asking about their input, and um, yeah. I think it's just a more inclusive way of having a phone call. Okay. Okay. Very good. Now, have you? Have, do you? Are you on remote phone calls yeah, on occasion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, it's like the biggest. I don't think that our team does a fantastic job uh, of that. Um, uh, Adonis can challenge me on that, but I think it's so hard for the reasons that you said to remember that people are even on the phone. Yeah. Uh, you don't see them, and, and if they're trying to hide or maybe they're a little bit introverted or whatever, it's a super, super, super big challenge. But the employee experience for the people that are not in the same room is dramatically different from the experience of people that are in the room. Uh, and so you might think the culture in your team is healthy and everybody gets along well, and whatever, but that may not be the experience of people that you're not engaging in that conversation. So it's super important, but I think we're not, would you agree we're not great at it? Not great yet. Okay. We're, we're on our way to being great, but we're not great yet. Yeah. <laughs> OK, and then the rest of you must have picked the introvert extrovert scenario. Is that right? Yeah, OK. Uh, who wants to talk about that first? Yes, sir. So we did that. And uh, the three things that we picked out is the most important. Uh, we're making a habit of asking questions. Uh, if one of the more extrovert people in the room uh, could like almost take charge of the group and uh, include everyone through questions, I felt like that was a very good uh, and then taking action to reduce the stressful situations, uh, perhaps picking a comfortable environment or through questions making them feel like they're accepted. And then uh, ensuring all voices are heard. Uh, they do eventually speak up, you know, making sure you meet their, their comments with you know, praise and ensuring that they're very OK, very good, very good. Yes, sir. I would like to challenge that because um, if you, you speak about introverts and extroverts, making a habit of asking questions makes the introverts very uncomfortable. So um, I don't agree with that. Just at one point. What would you What would you do instead to make sure their voices are heard? Or or would you, are you saying that um, where's the questions one? This one. Yeah. Are you Are you saying that doesn't apply for introverts? Or are you saying there's different uh, uh, approach that you might take? Or I would argue that. Uh, it, it, it mainly depends because uh, I can I, I, I believe I'm an introvert myself and most of my friends would agree uh, and if 
making a habit of asking questions to the introverts would make them a lot more uncomfortable than they already feel. What would you, given that you, you're a self-proclaimed uh, or a recovering introvert, what, what, do you, <laughs> what would you like to happen to you uh, in those um, cases? From my own perspective, uh, I, I try to examine my own assumptions first uh, instead of um, assuming that the extroverts get better job opportunities and uh, things like that. I, I would like to examine my uh, assumption, own assumptions first and uh, after that, um, the second thing I do is if I have a really strong reaction, the one on the bottom left, uh, if you have a strong reaction to someone, ask yourself why. So if I have a strong reaction to someone, I try to see that, uh, no, that might not be the case. Push back on yourself a little. These are the two main things that I try to practice. Okay, good. One, one thing that uh, I want to challenge you guys is, is asking questions in the meeting and in the moment. The only time you can be asking them questions. So what are, uh, you know, there's other opportunities, I think, for me to ask you questions instead of in this big forum in front of all these people, like maybe outside on the way to the bus where you and I can chat about something, right? That might feel a little bit more approachable. So I would challenge your thinking a little bit that maybe not all these things have to be applied in the meetings that you're in. Maybe some of these things can be applied when you're in one-on-one -on -one conversations as well. Yes? Sir. Scenario, but just in response to that, there are also many different ways to express opinions and views that aren't verbalizing them. But there's a lot, I mean, I've managed kind of larger teams where if you have more than seven people in a room, it's always really hard to hear a voice just in general with the number of people. So doing more, you know, speaking note exercises or homework before you come to the meeting, things like that to hear those voices. Um, not necessarily in the discussion in the room itself. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Yes? So, uh, for me, the top inclusive behavior is ensure all voices are heard for this scenario. And as someone who considers themselves more introverted, I always think back to like, growing up, I was much more shy than I am today. And I, I recall just like being picked on by teachers to speak up, because I think they do a good job, like, when I recall, just like of teachers wanting me to be more outspoken and saying like, hey, Jorge, hey, why don't you speak up more? And like, when you share something, it's okay. Like, don't feel nervous or timid. So I always felt like, although you feel nerve wracking and your heart's beating and everything, uh, I, at the end of the day, I always appreciated it that I had teachers in my life growing up that would call me on, like support me and say like, because like, I think that's initially what they were trying to do, right? Um, so I think it gives you more confidence growing up and the positive reinforcement that I had from those teachers and those role models really, I still carry it with me years later, like today. And I think that is the number one like, most important behavior that you can exhibit. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you guys honed in on this because I think one of the, one of the challenges is that my team is 60, there's 62 people on my team, something like that. The combined intelligence of 62 people on a team is phenomenal. But how well do you think I capture that value? Like I'm not getting 100% value from that team, right? Just, there's just, it's very, even if I was nailing all 10 of these things, it's just very, very difficult. The more I can nail these 10 things, the closer to 100% I'm gonna get. Uh, uh, but I think making sure that I, I remember that everybody is coming with their own unique contribution to the conversation and to the team and the, what we're working on, uh, I think is a key, key part of that. Okay, I wanna switch over to Q&A, but I wanna make one, uh, before I do that, I wanna just ask you guys one, one thought exercise. So introverts and extroverts, who do you think gets better job opportunities? Somebody mentioned this. Who do you think gets better job opportunities, introverts or extroverts uh, in, in companies? Tell me. Extroverts, why, why do you think that is? I don't know, um, I just, I think that initial um, that initial meeting is very important. So societally, you might be drawn to somebody who is, you know, able to make a, a lot of eye contact and just really engage you, and you know, kind of take the business end out of it and show you their humanity and their personality easily. Okay. Um, I just feel like employers are drawn to that. They're busy and they don't have a lot of time to kind of weed things out in those initial interviews. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so given that extroverts get better job opportunities or more advanced, faster advancement or whatever, whose fault is that? <laughs> Everybody is a lot of people. A lot of people. Um, you brought up the, in, the introvert thing first. Who, whose fault is it that 
extroverts get better job opportunities. No question. I'll, I'll buy that just because I want to get to Q&A. The reason, <laughs> so, so here, here's the thing that I would tell you. Ignoring whose fault it is, it doesn't matter. It's a sy systematic thing or systemic thing that uh, the introverts in the room, raise your hand if you think you're an introvert. I am, I think I am. What are you gonna do to make sure you're successful in spite of the system conspiring against you to getting fast job opportunities? I would treat your introversion not as a personality trait, but something you need to work on or get better and better and better at. Just like you know, learning math skills or those kinds of things. That's what you did, right? Um, uh, somehow you just acknowledge that, hey, for, for me, I tend to be more introverted. What am I gonna do to make sure I'm successful in spite of tending to be more introverted? Okay, let's switch to q and I know uh, some of you guys are getting suitcases to get on the bus, is that right? So if you need to do that, feel free, I, I won't be offended at all. But for the rest of you that can stay until about a quarter of questions, comments, concerns about anything we spoke about today? Yes? As a white cis male, why are you interested in that? <laughs> Very good. Um, the first thing it was, I don't know why my slides are kind of in cockamamie order here. Uh, the first thing for me was really that pragmatic thing. I was not finding enough, uh, enough. Uh, employees to fill the jobs uh, that I had. At the time, it was predominantly software engineering jobs. Increasingly, it's becoming more business-oriented roles. Uh, but I wasn't finding out of candidates. Uh, there's such a strong competition for business and software engineering roles, uh, uh, especially in the Puget Sound, more so in even Silicon Valley. It was very, very difficult for me to find those roles. But if you pull that thread a little bit, like, okay, what is happening in my culture that we're not as welcoming to those diverse uh, um, uh, perspectives, you know, is there a cultural thing? Uh, at, do I need to change the way I recruit? Uh, so I started pulling the thread and like analyzing this whole, I, have, I still have somewhere a fishbone diagram, you guys have seen those, right, that I tried to identify all the things that I was doing wrong so that because, um, such that my team was predominantly straight white male uh, folks, right? Um, and so that's how I became interested in it. It was a business problem that it turned into, okay, gosh, this is really an interesting problem space uh, for me, so, so that's how. Yes, sir. Um, how do y'all <clears throat> measure diversity and measure inclusion at Microsoft? Diversity is a lot easier to measure because we can go by heads, right? We can say, hey, in this room we have X number of, of women in, in the room. Um, what, if it, what, if, what if you have, let's say, 25 uh, white women and yeah. one black woman? Yeah. Do you think she's going to consider it diverse? Um, well, let me tell you how we measure it. Uh, and I don't know if I'll do a good job of telling you how I think she feels, but, um, but the company measures that. We take a, uh, an onboarding survey and let people announce who they are to their comfort level. You can say, I'm female, I'm male. Uh, we have a couple other gender choices as well. Uh, you can say, I'm African American. You can say, I'm Latino. You can say, I'm Asian, whatever. You don't have to uh, commit to any of that, but that's how we count uh, today. We publish those metrics on our, on our website. You can go to Microsoft.com, WAC Diversity, I think is where you can find it, and see how we're doing across different business sectors at Microsoft against those dimensions. Inclusion is way harder. Inclusion is way harder because uh, we don't have a useful rubric that evaluates teams on those 10 inclusive behaviors, for example. Uh, we have proxies that we use, like uh, we have an um, annual survey where we ask employees what their employee experience is. Um, there's a score that we call WHI, which is Work Group Health Index. It's been around for about 20 years at Microsoft and now other companies. And then one of those dimensions is, does the work environment feel inclusive? There's 10 or so questions that kind of recruit to that. Um, that metric is what we use to measure inclusion, but in my mind, it's a little bit of a proxy uh, for the real thing. Yes, sir. So how about during team meetings, how do you get introverts to be a part of the conversation? Uh, how, what do I do, or what are the things we need to do to be successful? What, like, what do you do? What do I do? Okay, that's an easier question. I don't think we're successful, as I mentioned before. I don't think we, we do a great job. Some things that we do, I, I like to identify people in the room whose perspectives are not being heard, but I think could add value and follow up with them afterwards. Um, so that's one thing I, I try to do. Um, we also will ask questions in a room and we'll let people either raise their hand or shout it out. We don't raise hands, but shout out the, the question that they have. But we also, uh, because we have uh, 40, 40 of our 60-person team is remote, 
We uh, host a lot of team meetings uh, over uh, Teams, over what used to be Skype. Um, and we let people chat in their questions as well. So they don't have to raise their voice, especially on the phone. Somebody's monitoring that chat window to see what questions are coming in. Uh, and people in the room, if they don't feel comfortable speaking up or they're not able to kind of wedge into the conversation, they can also enter a chat. And somebody is there, like I said, monitoring that, making sure that we pick off those questions as they come in. Um, the other thing that I do is I don't, uh, I believe that I'm an introvert, at least as defined by when I'm done with this conversation, my energy will be low and not high. So that's how I define in introversion. I don't, I don't, uh, this conversation sucks energy, not creates energy in me. Um, no, no offense. Uh, but uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not likely to treat you with kid gloves if you are introverted. And so I'll look you in the eye and say, Jose, is that right? No, no, Jorge. Jorge, Jorge, sorry. Jorge, Hello. I'm a, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'll look Jorge in the eye and say, Jorge, what, what do you have to say about that? Or what do you think about that? Uh, and, and it will be uncomfortable in some cases. Over time, I think it gets less and less and less uncomfortable. Um, uh, so those are the three big things uh, that I do. Yes, sir. Just curious, uh, you showed the, C the video of the CDI program. Yeah. What is Microsoft doing to basically extend the technology, let's say, on, on Native American reservations? Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. So we actually have a project uh, here in Arizona up in the um, Navajo Nation, the northern part of the state, uh, that coincidentally Adonis is leading, where um, the uh, Navajo Nation is broken down into 110 chapters. So 110 chapters. Many of those are disconnected from water power uh, 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 network. Uh, and so we have a program where we're trying to make sure that each of those chapters, uh, specifically the chapter houses, the community centers in those communities, have access to at least energy and, and uh, network connectivity. So that's a project that we're working on. It will take a while. Uh, it's a very big area, as you know. I think it's roughly the size of West Virginia uh, up there. Uh, some of those chapters are pretty far away from fiber and energy, and so we won't fund, exclusively fund, all the fiber pathways that have to be created, because that's billions of dollars probably. Uh, but we are kind of slowly, slowly, slowly enabling those uh, chapter houses. That's one, uh, one specific project. Are there other things that you wanted to talk about this morning? We also yeah. have a lot of uh, programs here, partnering with the University of Arizona. Uh, we're working with the, the Office of Early Action and in their MESA project in particular, and so that serves indigenous communities across the state. We're working with Native Nations Institute, which I happen to be a graduate research assistant when I was here, um, and they're helping to build out entrepreneurship programs uh, in the neighboring communities here in Tucson with the Tanatum and Pasquillan people, just to name a few. Other questions in the room? Yes. Okay. And a lot of it is because we like do these meetings and then students sit with students that look like themselves and then tend to only talk to those students yeah. as opposed to other people. How do you all combat that at Microsoft? I think the the biggest lever that we have on that problem is make sure that we're recruiting those diverse perspectives in the team in the first place. If you don't have that in the team, there's not a ton you can do about it. Um, so that's probably the, where we spend most of our energy. Um, but the other part is um, that we, our team I think is pretty diverse. We have a significant uh, a female population in our team. We have Native American background, we have African American background, Latino background. We even have a Canadian on the team for goodness sakes. Um, Adonis' boss is Canadian. Um, so I, I think for our team, it's it's fair, it's easier than others in, in order because just you know if you want to work with somebody else on the team, they're unlikely to be like you. Um, the thing that I would do, I think it, one of the challenges that I have with the University of Arizona that I've felt frustrated by for a long time, just to be transparent, is that the University of Arizona actually doesn't reflect necessarily the community that the that hosts the university. Right, it's relatively small number of Latino, relatively small number of Native Americans that attend this university. Um, so I think you have, there's a recruiting problem that you should think about uh, a little bit. How, what are you doing to recruit uh, diverse students into the, uh, into the, the team? So 
that's one thing that I would focus on. The other thing I would focus on is, you know, you working for LR, you can be an agitator. You can say, hey, I see you in the Billabong shirt and, and cap, Patagonia cap. You're always hanging out with this other guy. Why don't you start working with that other girl for a little bit and, and see what you guys can do to maybe enhance your project and that kind of thing. So you're, as a leader in that organization, just go agitate a little bit. <laughs> They'll thank you for it eventually. <laughs> okay, last question. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your team like, predominantly work on? Is it all diversity and inclusion type issues, or is it more? Uh, uh, good question. So we focus on community development for our data center communities. So we have data centers in many communities around the world. Our goal is to make sure that Microsoft has a healthy relationship with the communities that host our data centers. Uh, and it's important for a few reasons. One is that we want to make sure that the communities welcome our, our presence and we have this kind of social license to operate there. Uh, but we also want to be a good employer in those communities where people say, hey, I want to go work for Microsoft. Because unless people want to go work for Microsoft, there's no point in us having facilities there. Um, so we, we focus a lot on just maintaining good relationships with those uh, communities. Um, which there's a variety of projects. In some cases, communities don't want us there. And so there's a lot to work to be done. Uh, in some cases, the communities really want us there and it's just kind of investing and continuing those, that relationship building. Um, so that's predominantly what we, what we do. Yeah. Okay, guys, for those that are going to Phoenix, drive safe. Rest of you have a good spring break. Thank you.